ahead and get started this evening. Um, I'm going to open us a word of, word of prayer, and then we're going to dive in to our text this evening. Abrahamim, Father of mercies, we worship you, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity to gather together, for the uh, chance to dig into your word, to uh, learn more about who you are, about your character and nature, and to uh, draw closer to you in our walk through Yeshua and our walk in Yeshua. Lord, I pray that as we enter into discussion this evening, that every word that will be spoken will be spoken to the glory of your holy name, that our hearts will be humble to receive from you, and that, uh, Lord, we will allow you to move in our midst tonight. B'Shem Yeshua Meshachinu. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray, and everyone says, Amen and Amen. All right, so tonight we are uh, diving into a new study on First and Second Thessalonians. Uh, I just want to take a quick second to remind if you're joining us online uh, and you would like to be participatory in our Bible study tonight, make sure you're on the Facebook Live uh, video because on there I'm able to, uh, within reason, actively watch the comments as they come in, and you can make your comments on there, and I will try my best to interact with them and to answer questions or respond to comments that are made uh, on the, uh, the app there. So with that said, we're going to go ahead and dive into uh, Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians this evening. Uh, and as we do, I just want to set up a couple of things for you. Um, first and foremost, as is obvious, uh, when you start to look into Thessalonians, it is one of the many Pauline epistles, one of his letters to uh, Messianic communities that he has either impacted or started or been involved with. And so 1st uh, and 2nd Thessalonians are letters that he is writing writing to a specific community, it is estimated that he likely wrote uh, 1 Thessalonians somewhere around, give or take, the year 50 common era, give or take, uh, maybe 51-ish, um, and he likely wrote 2 Thessalonians later that exact same year uh, and sent it out. Uh, so at this point, we're talking 50, 51 common era. We're looking somewhere around, give or take, 20 years before the destruction of the temple uh, and uh, everything that goes along with that. And so uh, we're moving into this part process where Paul is sharing a little more about his heart as he's moving through uh, through this letter. And what's really interesting about Thessalonians, there's actually two things, one of which we'll touch on in a moment, but the first is that uh, Thessalonians is likely, First Thessalonians is likely the second earliest letter that we have from Paul, uh, uh, date-wise, that it's likely the second earliest letter that he wrote, which is, is pretty interesting. And uh, another thing that I thought was pretty uh, pretty curious is if we look at Thessalonians, you'll notice that as we look at uh, 1 Thessalonians, it opens up with these words. I'm just going to read this first uh, verse of it real quick, and then I want to set up a little more for us. But it says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the community of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord, uh, the Lord Yeshua the Messiah, grace to you and shalom. Now, it's interesting because if we go to Romans 1, we go to Romans chapter 1, and it opens up with Paul, a slave of Messiah Yeshua, called to be an emissary and set apart for the good news of God. We go to uh, 1 Corinthians 1, and it opens up with the words, Paul, called as an emissary of Messiah Yeshua by the will of God. We go to 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 1, and he says, Paul, an emissary of Messiah Yeshua through the will of God. We can go to virtually any of his letters, uh, and you'll notice that he's got some sort of a, uh, a title or a, uh, 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 accolade of who he is and his role and his call in the, Messiah, in the body of Messiah, except for here in First Thess First and Second Thessalonians, where he doesn't say any of that. He just jumps right in. Uh, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy uh, to the community of the Thessalonians uh, in God, the Father, and the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. He just jumps right into it. He's not explaining who it is, who's speaking. There's this assumption that there's already a well-known and established knowledge of who he is. So that's pretty interesting. Now, 
just to set up context for um, where this community is, why Paul is talking to them, what his interaction has been with them previous to this. Uh, Thessalonia, uh, Thessalonica, sorry, Thessalonica was in uh, Macedonia or the northern part of Greece at that point. Um, and uh, as we look at Paul's journeys in the book of Acts, we can actually see where he first goes to Thessalonica in uh, Acts chapter 17, beginning with verse 1. If you have your scriptures, go ahead and open up there. Acts chapter 17, beginning with verse 1, says, After passing through Amph Amphipolis and uh, Apollonia, Apol Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went to the, to the Jewish people, and for three, Shabbat, uh, three Shabbatot, he debated the scriptures with them. He opened them and gave evidence that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead, saying, This Yeshua whom I declare to you is the Messiah. Some of uh, them were convinced and became attached to Paul and Silas, as were a number of God-fearing Greeks and no small number of the leading women. But some of the Jewish people became jealous, taking some wicked fellows of the marketplace and gathering a crowd. They stirred the city into an uproar. They attacked Jason's house, trying to bring Paul and Silas out to the mob. When they did not find them, they instead began dragging Jason and some of the brethren from uh, before the city officials, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here too, and Jason has welcomed them. They are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Yeshua. Hearing these things, the crowd and the city officials were confused. But after receiving bell from J uh, Jason and the rest, they released them. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas to uh, Berea. Upon arriving, they made their way to the Jewish synagogue. Now these were more noble-minded than those of Thessalonica because they received the message with goodwill, searching the scriptures each day to see whether these things were true. Therefore, many of them believed, as well as quite a few prominent Greek uh, women and men. But when the Jewish people of Thessalonica learned that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul and Berea, they, became, uh, they came there too, agitating and inciting the people away to, uh, and inciting the people. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul away to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those escorting Paul brought him as far as Athens. After receiving an order for Silas and Timothy to come to him uh, as soon as possible, they left. So we see Paul's uh, first interaction with uh, those in Thessalonica who become this believing community of Thessalonica uh, was um, on one of his journeys, it's uh, believed the second journey, uh, where they often call his missionary journey, um, uh, where he was going around and sharing the good news. And it's interesting that while he's in Thessalonica, uh, the, the the history says that it was probably somewhere around 200,000 people, give or take, in Thessalonica at the time, which at that point in time was a, a pretty significantly large uh, uh, community. And so there were somewhere around maybe 300 or so, uh, sorry, sorry, 200 or so thousand people there. And from what we understand historically, there was a very large Jewish community there. And so as we see with Paul, everywhere Paul goes, the first thing he does is he goes where? He goes to the synagogue, and he begins to share in the synagogue first and foremost. Why? Because Paul even says in Romans that the good news is to the, the Jew first, and then, or and likewise, or in the same way, to the Gentiles or to the nation. So he goes to the Jewish community first. He goes to the synagogue. He shares with them about what the Lord has done, about who Yeshua is as the promised Messiah of Israel. And then, after he's reached as many as he can there, he and those people go out into the city and they begin to share with the nations as well. And so here in Thessalonica, he's sharing, uh, he's, he's relaying the good news, the Besorah, the good news of Yeshua uh, to those that are there listening. And then he goes out to the community and specifically says while he's in the synagogue that there were a great number of uh, Jewish people that came to faith. There was a significant number of God-fearers, which were those of the nations who had who adhered to Judaism but had not converted to Judaism that became believers. And 
and that there was a great number of the leading women of the synagogue that became believers. And then he goes out to the community, and even more people come to faith. And this is when the Thessalonican Jewish community gets upset, and they start to cause problems. They try to kill Paul, which kind of is status quo for Paul. Every time he does something good, somebody tries to kill him, uh, and then he runs away. My favorite of those is where uh, they're trying to kill him, and they're, they're, they, they want to, they've got like this mob ready to kill him, and uh, they're arguing back and forth, and, and Paul goes, hey, uh, I see there's Sadducees and there's Pharisees. Well, um, they're only mad at me. These guys over here are mad at me because I believe in the resurrection, and the Pharisees get upset, and they turn on each other and start arguing with each other, and he sneaks out the back door. But every time that, that he goes somewhere, there's this community, or, or there are these people that try to, to, to end his message and try to end his life. So Paul takes off, and he goes to Berea, and in Berea, you know, we, we all hear about the, uh, the heart of the Bereans and, and how they heard the good news, and immediately after hearing the good news, they go and begin to study the scriptures for themselves. What a lot of people don't actually talk about is that that whole passage about the Bereans, uh, they, the, the, the context there tells us that they were, it was actually a Jewish community that he was dealing with there, that were going back to the Tanakh, back to the Torah, the Nevim, the Ketuvim, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, and they were comparing what Paul was saying about Yeshua against the word of God and seeing if it matched up, and then they became believers. And then the Thessalonican Jewish community heard that Paul had begun to share the good news in Berea and got upset and went and began to agitate the community there as well, causing even more problems. And so Paul's interaction with Thessalonica, his interaction with the Thessalonian believing community uh, is a bit tor uh, tormentuous, not because of the believers there, not because of the Messianic community, but because of the non-believing Jewish people who were upset about him sharing the good news and talking about Yeshua. And so this kind of sets us up for where we are as we look at uh, the, the, the beginnings of First Thessalonians this evening. And this sets up for us where this relationship comes from between Paul and the Thessalonican believing community and why in the world Paul felt the need to write to them to begin with, right? So we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Uh, we'll begin with this evening. We'll see how far we can get into chapter 2. Um, but I'm going to read the whole chapter in context, and then we'll come back to, uh, to, read, to, to dig through it a little bit at a time as we move through. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Oh, by the way, I, I do want to warn you, we, we, we likely, I don't think, will get there tonight, uh, but we very well should be there next week. When we get into second, uh, to, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, there is a section there that um, if you are not as familiar with some of the anti-Semitic rhetoric that has existed in the body of Messiah uh, over the years, especially in the early phases, the, the early centuries of what becomes the church, uh, then you'd be surprised at some of the information we're going to find out as we dig into chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians. Uh, and, and some of the, uh, for lack of a better way of wording it, intentional translational issues that we find in almost every single uh, English translation of the uh, the, the letter of 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. So, a little something to look forward to, and if we get to it tonight, awesome, but I expect we'll probably find it next week. Uh, so, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul, Silvanius, and Timothy, to the community of the Thessalonians, and God the Father, and the Lord Yeshua the Messiah, grace to you, and shalom. We always give thanks to God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers, continually remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and stead, uh, steadiness of hope um, in our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. We know, brothers and sisters loved by God, that you are chosen because... Only because our good news did not come to you in word only, but also in the power and in the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and with complete certainty, just as you know that kind, that what kind of men we proved to be while among you for your sake. You also became an, uh, imitators of us and of the Lord, having accepted the message of, uh, in much tribulation with the joy of the Ruach HaKodesh. So you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, uh, or Achaia, for the word of the Lord rang out from you, and every place your faithfulness towards God has gone out, so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves bring news about what kind of wealth 
welcome we had among you and how you turned to, to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Yeshua, the one delivering us from the coming wrath. Amen. So as we uh, dig into this, we're going to start back at the beginning as we always do. We'll, we'll work kind of verse by verse, passage by passage through. So verse 1, Paul, Silvanus, or Silvanus and Timothy uh, to, um, to the community of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Yeshua the Messiah, grace to you and shalom. Uh, so most would say that, uh, that, that it's likely uh, Silas. So when it says Silvanus, that it's likely speaking of Silas um, as it was Paul, Silas, and Timothy that were men ministering in Thessalonica to begin with, and it was uh, 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 Timothy that was left behind uh, to share a little more with them, and so it's just assumed that Silvanus is another uh, name or another way of, of saying Silas. Um, and it's interesting when we see the dichotomy of the the communication that Paul is using, because again, remember, Paul is now speaking to the Thessalonian, uh, Thessalonian uh, believing community that is made up of both Jews and non-Jews, right? We go all the way back to Acts 17, and we see it sets that up for us. The narrative uh, there tells us very clearly that he shared with this Jewish community, then he went out to the nations, there were God-fearers that came to faith, there were Jews that came to faith, and there were those of the nations in the city that came to faith. So there is a mixture of Jew and non-Jew alike, I would say, and, and you all Often will hear me talk about the the uh, believing communities that we read about in the Brich HaDashah or in the New Covenant writings. You'll often hear me call them Messianic communities, Messianic congregations, rather than church, because the reality of what we know is the church didn't exist for another two to three hundred years later. Uh, during the first century, they were not churches. They were Jews and Gentiles gathering together, often in synagogues, and then later on outside of traditional synagogues, in essence, still in a synagogue in a different way. And so what we know as a church per se didn't didn't occur for another 200 to 300 years and so when we're looking at this this was what we would think of today as a messianic jewish community right a messianic jewish congregation made up of jews and non-jews alike coming together in unity and the bond of the blood of messiah and of the power of the ruach HaKodesh, the holy spirit and so we see Paul kind of give a little nod to this idea of the Jew and Gentile one in Messiah coming together in this community here in verse 1 because he says, grace to you and shalom, or grace to you and peace. So the, the, in the, the, the text here, in the actual passage, it's really uh, kind of curious to see the way that he words this in, uh, in, in 1 Thessalonians 1 because in saying grace and peace, he's giving a nod, if you would, to both ideas because the idea of grace that's used here comes from the word uh, charis or charis sorry I'm using the uh, Hebrew guttural sound but charis and and it means grace or it means favor that you find grace or favor we see it as a Greek synonym for the word kana in Hebrew which means basically the same thing grace or favor but it's very much a uh, in the first century in this period of time it is very much a concept as he's using it from the Greek that comes Comes from the Gentile world. May you have favor, may you have grace, may you have uh, blessing, may you have a closeness of God is kind of the, the idea there. And then he goes on to say, and shalom or and peace. And so he's bringing together this ideology, this, this kind of connection of Jew and Gentile one together. And he's giving a nod to that with a, a welcome that includes both of them together, not one or the other separate from the latter. We go in. We always, verse 2, we always give thanks to God for all you, for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers, continually remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. Now, if we go back a little bit to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, we look at the whole you know, conversation about love and, and the superior way in love and all this kind of stuff. But verse 13 says, But now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Well, here we see in Thessalonians, Paul using the same imagery as he's talking about thanking God and praying continually for the Thessalonian believing community. And that he says, remembering before our God and Father, your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. Faith, 
love, hope, all mentioned again. Except this time, instead of encouraging, the, like he does in, in 1 Corinthians uh, 13, he's encouraging us to seek after these greater things, faith, hope, and love. Here in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, he's giving praise, if you would, and, and, and thanking God for the Thessalonians walking that out in a very literal sense in their own discipleship with the Lord. Verse 4, we know, brothers and sisters loved by God, that you are chosen because our good news did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Ruach HaKodesh and with complete certainty, just as you know what kind of men we proved to be while among you for your sake. Um, and, and I think this is really interesting, especially in lieu of our message this past Shabbat, because uh, as we look at this, he says, we know that uh, uh, brothers and sisters loved by God, that you are chosen because our good news did not come to you in word only. In other words, you didn't just hear it, but not experience some sort of transformative work. But instead, we know it because you heard it, you responded, and it was sealed with the power and in the Ruach HaKodesh and with complete certainty. Just as you know what kind of men we proved to be while among you for your sake. So Paul's saying, look, not only did we share the good news with you, which we already read about in uh, Acts chapter 17, not only did we share the Besor with you, not only did your hearts open up to and receive the good news of Yeshua, but you then turn around and were fulfilled in the sealing of salvation by the outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh and the power and presence of God. Just like we talked about on Saturday, right? People don't want to hear what we have to say about God unless they're seeing God in us first and foremost, right? And, and unfortunately, so often, we're more focused on trying to tell people about God rather than actually showing people in our lives and our actions and who we are, showing them who God truly is. And so uh, as we look at this, I want to encourage you that the world around us needs to see the power and the presence of God in our hearts and lives in the exact same way way that we read about it being seen here among the, the believers in Thessalon Thessalonica and what God was doing uh, there among them and how he revealed his truth to them all. So any questions on verses one through four or one through five, sorry, or any comments uh, with regard to that? And I am kind of bouncing back and forth to my computer as I'm looking for uh, uh, any questions or comments that may come in there uh, on Facebook Live. And uh, also, um, and also, uh, I just want to take a quick second. I see all of you guys saying shalom. Uh, I was already like deep into dealing with this, so I just kind of blazed by those looking for questions. So shalom to everybody that's watching online that have said shalom uh, already. Uh, I wasn't ignoring you. I promise. I did see them, but I was already into here. So, any questions or comments on one through five? Verse 6, you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having accepted the message in much tribulation with the joy of the Ruach HaKodesh. So you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, for the word of the Lord rang out from you, not just in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faithfulness toward God has gone out, so that we have no need to say anything, for they themselves bring news about what kind of welcome we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Yeshua, the one delivered delivering us from the coming wrath. So verse 6, you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, right? We talk about this all the time. As believers in Messiah Yeshua, as individuals bought by the blood of the Lamb and empowered in the Ruach HaKodesh, what we are supposed to be are imitators or emulators of Yeshua. We're to be emulators of the early believers of the, the Talmudim, the disciples that we read about when we're reading through the Brich HaDashah, through the New Covenant uh, writings. And it's vital that we live our lives in such a way that it honors and glorifies God in everything that we do. And so he said, here, you, uh, you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having accepted the message in much tribulation with the joy of the Ruach HaKodesh. In other words, and we just read it from Acts 17, right? Paul goes in, 
the, the Thessalonican community, Thessalonian community loses their mind. Uh, the Jewish community loses their mind because Yeshua is being taught and preached there, and people are coming to faith in Yeshua. Uh, Jewish people, Gentile people are coming to faith in Yeshua, and they're losing their mind. And you imagine if they tried to kill Paul, you know, they wanted to drag Paul and Silas out, they wanted to kill them. They were perfectly okay with beating the mess out of Jason and handing him over to the authorities and, and sharing false accusations against him and hoping that something terrible would happen with him you have to imagine that after Paul did in fact leave Thessalonica that the believers in Thessalonica and Thessalonica were then suffering some of the same abuse the same attacks the same uh, uh, vitriol and word vomit that Paul would have been and maybe even more so because they lived there they were from there and they were encountering these people every single day and so Paul says you've accepted the message in much tribulation but here's the key with the joy of the Ruach HaKodesh. Now, I don't, I don't know about you guys, but we live in a much different world today than the Thessalonian believing community would have experienced in, in a lot of ways. But the truth of the matter is, is the body of Messiah is still on attack today. We're getting attacked rather today, left and right. Everybody in the world around us disagrees with us. Nobody believes what we believe. Nobody accepts what we accept. Uh, in fact, there are many supposedly within the body of Messiah that are actually now working against us also. And you have uh, uh, theological shifts that have occurred, doctrinal shifts that have occurred where we're actually changing or attempting to change the word of God and, and how we interpret it and live it out. And we're we're completely bastardizing the word of God and what it truly looks like and means to be a believer in Messiah and to follow in his way. We're no longer, and, and I'm, I'm using inclusive language saying we because uh, although our congregation and, and, and significant portions of the body of Messiah are not guilty of this directly, the body of Messiah has allowed this to occur. And so to some degree, we still have some, some degree of guilt and responsibility in it and even more so a responsibility to preach the good news in a way that actually draws people back to the Lord. And so uh, as we look at the world around us and we look at where we sit today, the body of Messiah is very much still, in a very literal sense, experiencing uh, what Paul would call here the tribulation as uh, we, we deal with all these different issues that have arisen and that are going on and all of the, the, the hate and the anxiety that we may face and deal with. But the difference is that when the Thessalonian believing community encountered tribulation, encountered trials uh, for their faith, what was their response? Their response wasn't to get beat down. It wasn't to become angry. It wasn't to, 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 to ball up in the fetal position in a corner and cry. Their response was to find joy in the Ruach HaKodesh, to find joy in the presence of the Holy Spirit no matter what. So you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. What was the example? That when the world gets tough, when walking with the Lord gets tough, when things get difficult, we don't crawl into the fetal position in the corner. No, we turn to the presence of the Ruach HaKodesh to find our strength, our joy, and our passion for the kingdom of God. And they became an example to the rest of Macedonia and Achaia because of this. For the word of the Lord rang out from you, not just in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faithfulness towards God has gone out, so that we have no need to say anything. Why? Because people are seeing the power and the presence of God in your lives. They are encountering the presence of God because of you and they are hearing the good news of Yeshua not just out of your words but in what they are seeing in your actions in these difficult times. For they themselves bring news about what kind of welcome we uh, had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Yeshua, the one delivering us from the coming wrath. Now, as I told you earlier, uh, uh, Thessalonica had about 200,000 people, give or take, maybe a little more, and a significant number, uh, a significantly sized Jewish community in Thessalonica. But Thessalonica, as much of the Roman Greco world was, Thessalonica was a haven of pagan practice, ritual, and faith. And, and there were a multitude of cult religions, cult pagan religions, that were all over the place in Thessalonica. And so as we look here, he says in verse uh, 9, For they themselves bring the news about good news about what kind of welcome we had among you and how you 
the Thessalon Thessalonian believers, both Jews and non-Jews alike who come together, Jews coming from the, 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 the uh, traditional Jewish background, Jews coming from the synagogue, and, and those from the nations coming from idolatry, from, from all of these false idols, that you turned from, uh, to God from idols to serve the living and true God, but not just to serve him, to wait faithfully for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, in whom we have of faith in the resurrection of new life awaiting us because of his resurrection from the dead. Yeshua, the one delivering us from the coming wrath. So not only did you come to faith, not only did you leave the, the, the pagan idolatrous practices around you, not only did you walk away from that, turn your back on it, you came to faith in Yeshua, you experienced and encountered the presence of the Ruach HaKodesh, and then from there you turned and you became uh, a believer in whose life the light of Messiah was shining forth. You became one fervently waiting on the return of Messiah, Yeshua whom you recognize was raised from the dead and in whom we have faith in the resurrection a new life awaiting us because of and the reality that we are now being delivered from the coming terrible wrath that awaits the world around us. So any questions, comments, thoughts on chapter one? So we'll get to that. We'll get to that a little deeper, and I'm going to respond to you in a second. But we'll get to that a little deeper when we move to uh, into what I was talking about earlier out of chapter two, and we start to deal with some of the translational issues there uh, with the text. But uh, what's most important to remember is that at this point in time, there were. Uh, likely thousands upon thousands of Jewish people coming to faith and Yeshua was the Jewish Messiah, is the promised Jewish Messiah. And it wasn't the Jewish people or even the rabbis as a whole that uh, were producing problems for the body of Messiah. It was specifically the leadership of certain sects of Pharisees uh, who were causing all of these issues at this point in time. You also have to remember that by this point, you're, like I said at the beginning, we're 20 years, give or take 20 years from the destruction of the temple occurring, right? And the destruction of the temple occurs because Israel revolts against Rome, Rome crashes down, they wipe out the temple, then another... Uh, 60 years later, give or take, is when we have the Bar Kokhba revolt. Jerusalem is raised as a whole, and uh, the Jewish people are scattered throughout the, the diaspora again. And so what we see leading up to the destruction of the temple is a dichotomy that is beginning to occur between the non-believing Jewish world and the Messianic community, both Jews and non-Jews alike. This dichotomy is beginning to occur. There's this slow shift in which, uh, and it's interesting because as we watch the development especially moving into the middle of the second century and the early third century. Uh, and we watch the development of what becomes Christianity and the development of what becomes modern-day rabbinic Judaism. And what we see is that both really developed in the way that they develop reactionarily to each other rather than in any regard of their own development or, or their own direction and where they were supposed to be going. But Judaism, as we know it today, developed reactionarily to Christianity and where Christianity was going. So the more that, as we move into the third and fourth century, the more um, anti-Semitic the church became, the more that Judaism became shifted drastically the other direction, and they dug into the idea that you can't be Jewish and believe in Jesus. They started to, uh, you, you start to see things like um, uh, the, the idea that if 
you believe that Yeshua is the promised Messiah, even if you live a Jewish life, that you have actually left Judaism altogether, you start to see the development of things like in the Amidah, uh, one of the verses of the Amidah that basically is condemning those that believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, uh, and, and so on. We start to see these things develop, and it's not because of Jewish believers per se. It's specifically at that point, second, third century, and, and moving into the fourth century, the development of Christianity. And in the same, because Christianity started to do things like slowly rip away the Jewish identity of everything about Yeshua, right? We start to see Passover get pushed out of the picture. We start to see uh, all of these things occur, the shift from Saturday, Friday night and Saturday, the seven day Shabbat to, to the first day of the week as the Lord's day and all of these kinds of things. We start to see this shift. So as Christianity went this way, Judaism, rather than kind of running parallel with them or even curving in a similar direction, Judaism, who's already hurt and wounded because of the Roman destruction of Jerusalem and everything that's happened there, they're already hurt and wounded because there are Jewish believers who believe that Yeshua was the Messiah, and yet this Yeshua character didn't come and free us from Rome and all the, the atrocities that we were experiencing under Rome as we thought was going to happen. And so Judaism begins to develop even farther the other direction. And so what we know as Christianity and Judaism today are really reactions against each other that just continually continue to push them farther and farther away rather than anything else. So when we're looking in the first century, and at this point, like I said, we're about 20 years, give or take, before the destruction of the temple, this rift has already started to occur between non-believing Jews and believing Jews. And it wasn't a big rift. It wasn't a, a huge thing at, at first. But you got to imagine over the course of the last 25 plus years uh, leading up to where we're at now in roughly 50, 51 common era, the last 25 plus years uh, of the spreading of the good news and the the, the leadership of the, the Pharisaic movements in Judea and Samaria that had issues with it and were trying to shut it down, they're now sending people out like they were Paul. Paul was going out as a representative of them to rid the world of believers in Yeshua until he became a believer in Yeshua. And so they're sending emissaries, they're sending uh, emissaries out into the, the, um, the, the Jewish community scattered around to try and, and make sure that they're protecting people from what they view as a theological problem. Uh, and so it wasn't that there was necessarily some kind of evil nature or character or whatever to them. And, and honestly, I would venture to say that even the, the, the most villainized of the Pharisees who were actually part of the problem, it wasn't that there was anything innately evil about what they were trying to do or what they thought they were doing. In Judaism, rabbis take the idea of being a shepherd of our flock very seriously. And so they did not believe Yeshua was the Messiah, and they were trying to protect their flock from something that they felt was going to lead them away from the Torah, away from the Word of God, away from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, and so they were doing their best to try and, and protect their flock from what they were afraid of, what they thought was going to be a harm or a problem, not that they were trying to do something that was innately evil or or or, or vindictive or whatever else. Does that make sense? So honestly, in a lot of ways, especially translationally, and we'll get into this when we move into to later part of chapter two, translationally, that, um, that attitude that, not that you had that attitude, I, I understand where your question is coming from, but that attitude that vilifies the Pharisees, that vilifies non-believing Jews in the first century, um, that attitude is actually from anti-Semitic uh, roots that are, are built into some of the translational work of the Bible into English and, and other languages and so on. And, and I'll, I'll back that up a, a little bit as we get into uh, particularly verse 14, 15 of chapter 2. We'll delve into that a little bit and we'll actually like open up a couple of different translations and, and I'll show you what I'm talking about there. Um, but it, it's, it's kind of interesting to look at how it all developed because it wasn't, like I said, it wasn't an intentional or uh, an, an evil thing. It wasn't an intentional problem. It wasn't anything like that. Uh, it's just the fact that they were afraid that they were going to lose people to what they believed to be a problematic theological uh, interpretation or a problematic theology in general. Uh, and they were trying to protect their flock as honestly any of us rabbis or pastors today would strive to do for our flock and our congregations, um, or I would hope we would. Um, but, you know, a lot of times 
because of the thought of the rabbis and the leaders and what have you in the body of Messiah, uh, we, even in Messianic Judaism today, it, it, sometimes there's like this natural aversion of everything rabbinic, right? We, we've got to avoid everything rabbinic. We've got to avoid everything that the Talmud says or everything that this or that or, or whatever, because, you know, they don't believe in Yeshua and we've got to be careful. But yet at the same time, we all have uh, specific things we do on Shabbat that are rabbinic. The way we keep Passover and, and particularly the way we observe the Seder is, is rabbinic because we don't have a temple anymore that we can go and do it the way the Bible says. So everything we do now is reminiscent or symbolic of those things from the Torah. And so it is rabbinic in the way we do it. Uh, and, and like an overwhelming majority of what we do, whether we admit it or not in Messianic Judaism today is derived from rabbinic Judaism. Uh, and so we've got to understand that we can't go, hey, we want this stuff, but we don't want this stuff because that's exactly what happened in the third and fourth century when we want Jesus, but we don't want any of that Jewish stuff that goes with them, right? And so we have to be really careful to balance that and to recognize, uh, and not only recognize, but also to advocate for the reality that the, the Jewish leaders, the rabbis, the Pharisees of the first and second century they weren't villains. They weren't evil people trying to do something evil against believers. They were simply trying to protect what they thought was getting uh, attacked, if that makes sense. Any other questions, thoughts, or comments on uh, chapter one? I'm scanning through the Facebook comments to make sure I'm not missing anything there either. All right, we're going to dive into chapter two. We'll see how far we can get this evening before uh, time runs out. Verse one, for you yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not in vain. On the contrary, after we had first suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had boldness to our God to tell you the good news of God, even in the midst of much opposition. For our urging is not uh, out of deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God uh, to be entrusted with the good news, so we declare it, not pleasing men, but rather God who examines our hearts. For as you know, and God is witness, we never came with a word of flattery or a motive of greed or seeking glory from people, whether from you or from others, even though we could have thrown our own weight around as emissaries of Messiah. Rather, we proved to be infants among you, like a nursing mother cherishes her children. And this way we were yearning for you. We were delighted to share with you not only the good news of God, but also our very souls, because you had become clear to us. You had become dear to us, I'm sorry. For you recall, brothers and sisters, our labor and hardship working night and day so as not to burden any of you while we proclaimed to you the good news of God. You are witnesses along with God of how devoutly and righteously and blamelessly we behaved toward you who believe. For you know how as a father with his own children, we exhorted and ex encouraged and urged each one of you to walk in a manner worthy of God. Who calls you into his own kingdom and glory? For this reason, we also thank God constantly that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as it is truly, as it truly is, the word of God, which does its work in you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's communities and Messiah Yeshua that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things at the hands of our own countrymen as they did from the Judean leaders who killed both the Lord Yeshua and the prophets and drove us out. They also they are not pleasing to God and hostile to all people, uh, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they might be saved. As a result, they constantly fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them at last. But brothers and sisters, after we were orphaned by separation from you, for, from you for a short time, in person, not in heart, we were all the more eager in our great longing to see you face to face. For we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, but Satan thwarted us. For who is our hope 
or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Yeshua at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. So back to uh, verse 1. For you yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not in vain. On the contrary, after we had uh, first suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to tell you the good news of God, even in the midst of much opposition. In other words, everyone around us was attacking us, and yet we still pushed forward for the good news. It didn't matter what anybody else thought. It didn't matter to us what anybody else said. It didn't matter to us how anybody acted. We had a task. We were going to share the good news with as many as we possibly could, and you benefited from it. And our work was not in vain because why? Because we see more and more and more of you coming to faith in Yeshua every day. For our urging is not out of deceit or impure motives or trickery, uh, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the good news, so we declare it, not pleasing men, but rather God who examines our hearts. Another way of wording this is I really don't care what anybody else thinks. All I care about is what God thinks. God gave me an assignment, gave me a task. I'm going to follow through with it. I'm going to do exactly what he laid before me, the task that he set before my feet. And nobody's going to stop me. They're going to have to kill me if they're going to stop me. Nobody's going to stop me. I'm going to continue to push forward. And because of people like you that are coming to faith, that are then turning around and emulating my life and the life of the Lord, because of your salvation and the way that the word of God is acting through and in you and the way the spirit of God is moving through and in you, many others are coming to faith as well. And this is what we're looking for. This is the glory that makes our hearts happy. This is what we are looking for. For as you know, and God is witness, we never came with a word of flattery or a motive of greed or seeking glory from people, whether from you or from others, even though we could have thrown our own weight around as emissaries of Messiah. We didn't ask anything of you. We didn't take anything from you. We didn't want anything from you. We weren't coming in trying to, to, to steer you wrong or to confuse you or to sow discord or anything like that. And we weren't coming in trying to build ourselves up and give ourselves props so you thought greatly of us, even though we rightfully could have solely because of the fact that we were emissaries, we were sent out ones of Messiah Yeshua. He sent us here for a distinct purpose, but we didn't throw that weight around on you. We didn't throw that around and try to make you uh, uh, kind of worship us or cast alto to us or, 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 or heed every little thing that we said as though we were your master. Instead, we just came and we shared the love of the Lord with you in all ways. Rather, we proved to be infants. Uh, and actually, the, the, if you look down, if you have a TLV and you look at the foot, footnote there, because that, that word infant seems kind of strange. It's the most direct translation, but it, it actually more likely uh, could be interpreted as gentle. And, and some manuscripts, some of the early Greek manuscripts actually use the word gentle there rather than um, uh, infants. But the reason the Tree of Life version in particular uses the word infant as that translation is because the oldest manuscripts they could get their hands on appeared to have it there uh, in that way but uh think it was infant or, or gentle or or kind among you like a nursing mother cherishes her children in this way we were yearning for you we were delighted to share with you not only the good news of god but also our very souls because you had become dear to us in other words we were laying it all before you we were serving you as we served the lord before you we were sharing the word with you as a mother would nurse her child. We were taking you from milk to meat. We were giving you everything you needed to bolster your discipleship and to build you up in your walk with the Lord in a way that not only could you be blessed, but you could bless others. And in that same way, they would be blessed by them. The, the Paul and Silas and the others would be blessed by the work of the good news occurring, the work of the gospel occurring through the hearts and the lives of the Thessalonians. Any questions or comments on verses 1 through 8 before we move on? Or try to move on? Got a few minutes left.
when you look at it from the the <clears throat> you look at it from the context of the verse before it, right? Where we said infant or gentle, he says, rather we prove to be an infant among you. And then he goes on to take that imagery to the next level, right? Like a nursing mother cherishes her children. In this way, we were yearning for you. Um, and there's this idea not just of the, the nourishment, uh, which a, a nursing mother, obviously there's physical nourishment, but with uh, raising disciples, with, with sharing the good news, there's a spiritual nourishment. There's a, a development that goes with that. Um, but at the same time, there's a, a natural love and compassion. There's a natural, uh, um, as he says, a yearning for the children. that and, and Paul often talks of the communities he's ministered to as his children, right? We, we can tell, at least from what we read in the Bible, that Paul was never married and, and Paul never had children. At least it appears as though he never had his own children. And so he looks to those that he leads to the Lord and— uh, as his own children, and then he looks to those that they lead to the Lord as being the next in lineage from him, right? And so there's this idea that he has of there very literally being this parent-child relationship uh, and his yearning, his desires to watch them grow in the Lord and become everything, you know, just like any parent for their child, to become everything that they're supposed to be, to become everything they want to be, or in Paul's case, to become everything that the Lord desires and yearns for them to be in their walk with him. Verse 9, For you recall, brothers and sisters, our labor and hardship, working night and day so as not to burden any of you, while we proclaimed to you the good news of God. You were witnesses along with God of how devoutly and righteously and blamelessly we behaved toward you who believe. For you know how, as a father with his own child, we exhorted and encouraged and urged each one of you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So he starts out, uh, verse 9, by saying, look... We never asked you for anything. We never took anything from you. We, we worked night and day to do whatever we needed to to not be a burden on you because we didn't want you to think that there was some linkage between you giving us money and you finding salvation, right? Remember, as I said before, pagan practice was huge in Thessalonica. Cult ritual was huge in Thessalonica. And so as we're looking at this, it says, look, I don't want you to think there's any connection between you giving us money, which some would say Paul is, is saying, hey, that means that a pastor or a rabbi or a uh, emissary or a missionary, whatever, shouldn't be paid for the work to do him. But that's, Paul then goes on in other places to say, you should be paid for what you're doing. Your role in these, in these, you should be paid for these things. You should be taking, you're investing your time and energy. You should be paid for it. And he's not saying don't uh, pay for it. What he's saying is, I'm dealing with somebody who has no context for this, and I want you to understand I didn't take anything from you. Remember, as people come in and try to uh, 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 cause more issues for you and try to, to steer you the wrong way and try to sell you all kinds of lies about who we are, that we never took anything from you. We never asked you for anything. All we did was give to you. Over and over and over again, we gave to you. And you were witnesses along with God of how devoutly and righteously and blamelessly we behaved toward you who believe. Verse 11, he carries that imagery on again, right? So we dealt with infant, now we dealt with mother and child. Now he says, for you know how as a father with his own children, we ex exhort exhorted and encouraged and urged each one of you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. In other words, we didn't tell you to buy anything from us. We didn't tell you to buy your way into salvation. We encouraged you. We uplifted you. We educated you. We taught for taught you. We mentored you. We modeled for you how to walk in righteousness before the Lord, how to be, as we see over and over and over again in the Word of God, how to be kedoshim, how to be holy ones in the Lord. And he says in chapter 1, you've already got the power, right? It was already there because not only did you believe in Yeshua and accept our, our message of the good news, but it became solidified in you through the working of the power and the presence of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit in your heart and life. And so he says, look, now we're just trying to encourage you, uplift you, to build you up, that you can not only be the best disciple that you can be, but even more so, you can be a disciple making disciples of all nations, as the Great Commission calls us to be and to do. Sorry, 
I saw a new comment had popped up. I was trying to see if it was a question or, or something that needed to be addressed. And I think we are going to pause there because we do not have enough time to dive into the latter half of chapter two. So we will leave this evening with a cliffhanger now that I threw out all the stuff about the, the translational issues. Next Tuesday, we'll dive into some of that and I'll share with you uh, what I'm talking about there. But I do wanna to just take a few minutes, uh, the, the last remaining time that we have to uh, allow, if there are any more questions or comments, if you're joining us on Facebook Live, uh, feel free to punch those in. I'm gonna leave our live stream open for a few minutes longer. If there are questions in-house, comments in-house or online, please throw those out so that we can interact with you. Um, I, I, I want you to understand with our Bible study in this always works best with bodies in house because you're able to interact and bounce directly off of me and, and we can communicate in that way. And we're trying our best online to provide as close to that atmosphere as we can with the comments and chats on Facebook Live. Um, uh, but I want, I want this, I'm not here just to preach at you. I do that on Saturdays, I do that enough. I don't come in on Tuesday nights to try and preach to you, but rather that we as a community, as a mishpacha, as a family, whether here in person or online, are able to dig into the word of God together to both foster our faith and to embolden each other to walk in truth and righteousness in the ways of the Lord. And how better to do, to do that than to dig into the word of God together as mishpacha, uh, united in spirit and truth. Uh, so with that said, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm, I want to sit for a moment in case there are more questions or comments, either in-house or online, uh, please feel free to throw them out there. Well, if there is nothing else, we will go ahead and end our live stream tonight. We'll pick up with 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 next week, next Tuesday night.